technology wants. I'd like to talk about what I call the never normal. The never normal is, I believe, what we're entering into. And it's a reference to a book that I wrote exactly 10 years ago, which was called The New Normal. What happens in a world where technology just stops being special, just becomes normal? This is exactly the transition, the S-curve, if you will, that we've seen in the last decade. Technology and digital used to be special, and then it just becomes normal. I love this illustration. In 2016, everybody wanted to take a selfie with Hillary Clinton. But in 2020, the Democratic Convention was a digital-only, virtual-only, online-only event. We've truly entered into a world where we're always connected, never offline. Truly the never normal. But we're now getting into a situation where, thank God, we had that new normal in the very strange episode of you know, the last 12, 13, 14 months. Something that seemed distant and far away changed all of our lives. And it reminded me very much of one of my favorite sci-fi movies of the last century, The Day the Earth Stood Still. What we just encountered was basically not the day, not the week, not the quarter. It was the year that the Earth stood still. We saw things that we never thought we would ever see in our lifetime. We saw scenes that we never thought we would ever you know, witness. And it was a collective displacement. It was something that happened you know, around the world. And for many companies, it was a test. It was the great 2020 digital stress test. We had to figure out if we could still survive in a world where technology, digital, was our only option. And look at lockdown. I don't know how you survived lockdown, but in our house, there was a perfect correlation between the quality of the Wi-Fi signal in our house and my appreciation as a father. If the Wi-Fi was okay, I was okay. But, you know, if there was just a tiny interruption, a little hiccup in their YouTube or TikTok stream, they openly started to question if I ever got a degree in computer science. And it wasn't just lockdown. In almost every exit scenario, we saw that technology was playing an ever-increasing role in our lives. I love this example in Singapore where a robot dog was patrolling a park to see if people were actually respecting social distancing or not. Who could have imagined something like this would be possible just you know, 12 months ago? So after a decade of digital becoming normal, most companies actually passed the great 2020 stress test. Not all of them got an A+, but for many companies, they started to realize that digital, that technology, the innovation, wasn't just a cherry on the cake, maybe it was the cake. We've truly arrived in this new normal, and ever since I wrote the book, I think we're getting into this blue pill, red pill momentum. You know, ever since I wrote the book, people have been asking me, what's the new, new normal? What's the next new normal? But some people said, ah, I kind of miss the old normal. And especially now in this BCAC changeover before and after Corona, as the vaccines are slowly starting to actually have an impact on the world, you know, we have a lot of people who are actually homesick for the old normal. Well, first of all, it's going to take longer than we think. But second of all, I find this fascinating. Maybe the old normal is dead. Maybe the old normal doesn't actually exist anymore. And we've been permanently changed as a result of technology. Actually, I believe we're just getting started. There's a lot of uncertainty. I think a lot of disruption in the next decade and a lot of opportunities. What I believe is that we're going to be faced with a number of seismic shocks. And some of these shocks will certainly still be technological in nature. It's not because digital is normal that it's done. No, as a matter of fact, a lot of technologies are going to be combined to even have an acceleration when it comes to how we're going to see these technological seismic shocks. But they're not the only ones. I mean, look at where we are now. We're in the middle of a biological seismic shock that is far from over. But think about the big concern we had before COVID. It was the environment, the planet. Think about ecological seismic shocks. This is a scene from Blade Runner 2049. I love the movie. Look at the orange sky. This is San Francisco after last summer. I mean, many of my friends who live there sent me pictures like this. Recently, we had Texas freezing over. A huge collapse of the power grid as a result with enormous consequences, personal and economic.
And think about the public discontent we had. That public discontent is a powerful force. Maybe we're going to see social seismic shocks. I mean, we saw a very strange one very recently in the US. But even the rising geopolitical tensions, I mean, a trade war between the US and China that is now escalating into a full-blown technological cold war, my conclusion is the world isn't getting more orderly, it's getting more disorderly. There's a lot of uncertainty, but we shouldn't be afraid because every single one of those seismic shocks, actually, they trigger things, they set things in motion, they create systemic shifts. Look at consumer behavior. This was already greatly altered as a result of digital becoming normal. We can now analyze a consumer and observe and predict better than ever before. And then COVID came along to actually accelerate that. COVID was the turbo on the acceleration of consumer behavior. Same thing with work dynamics. But more fundamentally, we're going to see that there is an extreme volatility in operating models and business models, in probably capacity and resources necessary to implement our strategy, and probably also in financial performance. So I believe that we're bracing ourselves for more change going forward, because it would be very naive to think that we're just going to go back to the old normal. I think we're getting into a world of constant change. That's what I call the never normal, where little things can have huge global consequences. The last couple of years, it was fashionable to talk about these four words, VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. I don't like these words per se, but I think it would be very naive to think that we're going to go back to a world of stability and certainty and simplicity and clarity. I'm not a big fan of this man, but he said it brilliantly. We're going to have more and more unknown unknowns. And that's exactly what I call the never normal. So let's dig a little deeper. In that never normal, we're going to see a number of characteristics. One of them is that we're going to see nonlinear behavior. We're going to see superfluid, hyperconnected, and ultra speed. Now, let's start with the first one, superfluid. We're entering a world where you know, a crisis is a good example of that. You have people who hope that you're going to snap back to the old normal, but then you see people who see this as an opportunity to do a step change onto the new normal. Look at the work environment. I mean, all of a sudden we were catapulted into remote working. If we went back to the office, it wasn't the same and it wasn't easy. I mean, I love this Fisher Price work from home playset, including video conference material, crying babies and wine bottles. Well, maybe it wasn't that bad, but it was bigger for part of a society or a bigger picture on how we deal with this bubble economy. It was the best of times for some people, but certainly for the next generation, it was very challenging. And if you look at the business side, this is the Berliner Philharmonic trying to be profitable in a setting like this. But I love this Dutch example. They put greenhouses in front of restaurants for people to enjoy a Corona proof meal. I love what Hawking said. Intelligence is the ability to adapt to change and we will need that in a super fluid, never normal. The second characteristic is that nobody seems to be staying in their swimming lane anymore. I mean, linear is out. Just before Corona, we had Sony who introduced us to their vision of mobility. Sony was building a car. At the same time, we had Toyota, a car manufacturer that was introducing us to the concept of the woven city, a city of the future where cars don't even function anymore. Nobody stays in their lane. Look at technology. The biggest cloud provider on the planet is Amazon, who comes from e-commerce. My favorite example is in China, where Ping An, the largest insurance company in the world, is reinventing itself into a healthcare platform provider with Ping An Good Doctor. Nobody stays in their lane. And I think probably the biggest problem that I see is that many people think, oh, we've arrived in the digital age. But I think we've arrived in the network age, where everything is connected to everything. This is the linear pendulum. Very easy to understand. I mean, first week of engineering school. But, you know, this is the linear pendulum, but they, if they unhinge one hinge and let it go, it's the same mass, it's the same volume, but the two forces are now connected together. And if you let it go, the resulting motion is completely erratic and unpredictable. And I love this example because what it clearly shows is, mind you, this is just two things connected to each other. What will happen in a world where everything is connected to everything? We're now experiencing what it is to live where everything is turned into network-based information, hyper-connected. 
And then we see the speed, I mean, ultra speed. And COVID was a great example of that. It was the best of times and the worst of times, winners and losers. This is maybe the craziest graph of the last pandemic, the market value of Zoom compared to the combined market value of seven of the largest airlines added up. And Zoom was worth more than seven of the largest airlines. And the reason is very simple, we stopped flying. I mean, this is air patterns over Europe in March of 2019 and March of 2020. And what is fascinating here is then, then you see the ripple effect of a connected economy. I mean, you know, we stopped flying, well, the airlines need less planes, Airbus scrapped 15,000 jobs, they order less engines, Rolls-Royce cuts 9,000 jobs. We stop flying, we don't need rental cars, Hertz goes out of business. Clearly the worst of times. And then you see the best of times. We massively started to shop online. The CEO of Shopify said our wildest dreams for 2030 were just realized in the summer of 2020. We massively started to shop online, huge shift in consumer behavior, enormous boost in e-commerce, enormous boost in logistics. And I think this was a teaser of that never normal. The never normal where we're going to see super fluid, non-linear, hyper-connected and ultra speed. Because I fundamentally believe that we need to prepare now for a world that is constantly going to be changing. Now, the theory behind this is the theory of optionality. Whatever you do, you start, you grow, you peak, and you decline. And if you wait until the very last moment to think about what's next, you're too late. Even at the peak, it's no longer capable of reinventing yourself. You have to do it when you're doing very well, and then you can keep reinventing yourselves. What it means is that if you're a traditional player, an incumbent, and an incumbent is not a bad word, it means you did something very good in the past, and you see your first challengers or challenges, the first time you think, ah, no problem. The second time you think, oh my God. And the timing between that is what we call corporate myopia. And that one is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's important not to delude yourself that you're actually moving fast enough. The Germans have a wonderful word for that, Eisenbahn Scheinbewegung. Eisenbahn is the iron road, the railroads, and Scheinbewegung is the false move, a dummy move that a soccer player makes to put you on the wrong foot. If you combine it, the Germans describe the feeling that if you're in a stationary train in the station and next to you is another stationary train who starts to move, you feel like you're moving. The only language in the world who has a word for that is the German, Eisenbahn Scheinbewegung. But many companies are suffering from innovation, Eisenbahn, Scheinbewegung. They think they're innovating, but they're not. I can guarantee you the next decade, I mean, we're now in the new normal, but the next decade, the never normal, is going to be more technological disruption, more changes in consumer behavior, more volatility in markets, and more changes in operating models. It's a roller coaster ride, and it's accelerating. And let me add a few you know, side notes to that. There is a gap. There is an absolute gap between what is possible and what is real. I mean, look at automation. The last couple of years, it was fashionable to look at the rise of automation. Everything was going to be done by machines. It was going to be autonomous driving and autonomous delivery, autonomous this, autonomous that. This is something that is actually in every single sector. This is John Deere, a tractor builder says, putting humans on tractor. How old school is that? This is the bossa nova robot. This is a robot used in retail to scan the aisles to see what needs to be done. And the Walmart was a big customer. In full pandemic, Walmart said, you know what? We're going to go back to humans. I think we might be entering a hangover moment. Some of us are disappointed. I mean, I love this Peter Thiel quote. We wanted flying cars, but we got 140 characters. You've all been there. I was blown away when Google DeepMind beat the best Go player four years ago, five years ago. But actually, you know, the last 12 months, you go to Google, you search for something, you find it, you buy it, and the next three days you get ads for the product you already bought. That's not artificial intelligence, that is colossal stupidity. We might be getting into a more manageable way of thinking about automation, maybe a more down to earth. This is the latest Boston Dynamics robot. No more dancing robots or running parkours, it's stacking boxes. There's a gap between what is possible and is real, and we have to be careful that we don't push humans to the limit. I mean, Corona pushed us to the limit. I mean, a lot of the things that we liked weren't there anymore. I love this 
cover of the New Yorker. We put on a brave face in front of our screens, but the reality is that many of our lives were pretty messed up. I mean, even the CEO of Microsoft says, too much screen time, not good for your mental health, and we're concerned. We're concerned about the impact it has on society. So it's time we put the human back into the factor. I love this example for IKEA that used this on social media to actually put ideas out there for people who, you know, couldn't go to IKEA because of lockdown or quarantine, but who already had stuff from IKEA. And IKEA wanted to give them ideas on how to be creative with the stuff you already have. And very soon, people started sending in how they had implemented that, what they've done with that. And I love this. It's putting the human back into the picture. You all remember that famous advertisement from Burger King who said, wow, it's a pandemic, go to McDonald's. How do we combine that technology constant change with the human element? How do we put the human back into the equation? How do we value on the human premium? But make no mistake, it's a roller coaster ride. It reminds me of that famous quote by Hemingway when he went bankrupt. He was asked, um, Mr. Hemingway, how did you go bankrupt by a journalist? And he said, well, in two ways, gradually and then suddenly, very slowly and then boom. And this is what we've seen. These are the, I think, signals and patterns of the never normal. Things that are happening slowly, all of a sudden burst onto the scene. Look at the retail apocalypse of 2020, especially in the US where, of course, it's easier to go bankrupt or in Chapter 11. We saw one failure after another, one store closure after another. A company like H&M has closed hundreds of stores globally, never to be reopened. But it can go the other way. The gradually and suddenly can also be a positive thing. Look at L'Oreal. They had a wild ambition to do 20% of their business online in the next three years. And they said, well, we did it in eight weeks. H&M closed hundreds of stores. IKEA opened up more stores than ever before, but they're different. They're adapted to that reality of the changing consumer in the never normal. Roller coaster ride. And then my big question for you is, do you have the right instruments to deal with that? Not just technology, but how are you looking at the future? How are you dealing with a world where technological innovation becomes the new normal, but it's about constant change? I mean, look at the budget 2020. What a joke that was. I think that many companies now have aging instruments to deal with that roller coaster ride. And if they want to be prepared for the never normal, well, first of all, they're going to have to be resistant. They're going to have to be robust. They're going to have to figure out how to keep operating in these very challenging times. But even more important is going to be resilience. The capability to bounce back, take advantage, even bounce forward. And in that, you need you know, a keen eye on what I call the day after tomorrow. But it's an opportunity to reinvent yourself. I call this the phoenix and the unicorn. The last 10 years, we all talked about the unicorns. I mean, the new kids on the block, but even they suffered. I think it's now time after a decade of applauding the unicorns to think about the phoenixes, traditional businesses reinventing themselves. Look at retail. I mean, retail has been changed by technology. I love this you know, cover from The Atlantic, the touchscreen generation. And this is a Santa Claus letter of a young girl who writes, Dear Santa, how are you? I'm good. Here is what I want for Christmas. And the Amazon URL of what that child wants to have. Amazon is the big fat unicorn that is not just doing online, but changing retail itself. These are the Amazon Fresh. They now have more than 15 in the US where they're putting technology inside the physical stores. That's the unicorn we know. But this is the Phoenix. Walmart is the biggest traditional retailer on the planet, the biggest supermarket in the world. 2.5 million employees. And it's a battle. I love this example that Walmart has now in the US opened up this in-home shopping. You buy something on the Walmart app, a Walmart associate comes to your house, delivers the goods, but can unlock your smart door and put the stuff inside. And if you allow them, they are even capable of storing your fresh things in your refrigerator. You can follow everything that happens you know, with a camera and connectivity. Walmart is now transforming their experience and is even transforming their stores, many of them into warehouses and distribution centers. But they've always been customer focused, but they changed their positioning on that. This always meant being customer focused, lowest price guarantee. Now it turns out time is more important than maybe just cost. 
If you're working two jobs in the US, then saving 15 minutes in your day might be more important than saving 15 cents on a packet of cornflakes. But these big tankers that have to be changed, I mean, it's a lot more difficult to do a phoenix than a unicorn. But I believe in this roller coaster, we're going to need a keen eye on what I call the day after tomorrow. This is an example, New York in 1911 where you know, everybody sees horses and carriages, and then the very first automobile arrives onto the scene. Imagine that you lived in New York in 1911. You've never seen an automobile. What would you think if you saw it? Would you be angry or scared or excited? This man was very angry. Ed Klein sold horses, and he said, don't buy an automobile. Actually, he put this advertisement in the New York Times to convince people not to fall into the trap of the automobile. There's only one conclusion. I mean, Ed didn't see the day after tomorrow. How much time do we spend on today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow? Today is the hundreds of emails, the dozens of Zoom calls. Tomorrow is next year's budget. And the day after tomorrow, new ideas that could change the rule of the game. How much time? Many people say 70, 20, 10. Reality often is 93, 7, and 0. And the problem is value. Today is important. Tomorrow even more so. The day after tomorrow becomes crucial if you want to reinvent yourself. The problem is that a lot of attention actually isn't split over these three. There's that big red square with negative energy called the shit of yesterday. I love this painting by Magritte, La Clairvoyance. How do you interpret the egg and figure out what that day after tomorrow bird will be? So let me round up with two things. If you want to reinvent yourself, we clearly have to do things differently. But think about this, what future are you building? The first is strategically. If you want to build strategy for the never normal, you're going to have to be bold on the vision, but flexible on the details. I mean, the last couple of years, these unicorns, they did one thing. They raised the Olympic minimum when it comes to customer expectations. I mean, customer experience has gotten to a completely new level. It's no longer enough to KYC, know your customer. It's not data, it's our KYC, really know your customer. And think about this. If you want to build a strategy for the never normal, how can you be essential for your customers? But that's not enough. Even more important is how can you be relevant? Essential was okay in the past. Relevance is going to be crucial if you want to reinvent strategy for customers in the never normal. But the second part is the mindset. It's not technology. It's not innovation. But I came up with something which I call vaccine. It's an incorrectly spelled six letter word. The V is for velocity. The world is moving faster. We have to move faster. I love this quote from Andretti. If everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. For me, this was 2020. The hospital in Wuhan being built in 10 days. That's the raw speed of the never normal. But it's not just speed, it's agility. It's being able to adapt. I love this analogy of the whitewater kayaker. First, it seems scary and dangerous. The water could kill you, the rocks could crush you. But if you learn how to read the river, you can use the power of the river to your advantage. Speed, agility, and we will have to fire on you know, all the creative elements to focus on the eye, innovation, product innovation, market innovation, service innovation, and model innovation. Look at a company like Disney. They had a rough year in 2020, movie theaters closed and you know, um, the theme parks were closed and they reinvented themselves with a completely new business model with Disney+. Plus. The last two, the end is for networking. We don't live in the digital age, we live in the network age. And if the outside world starts to behave like a network, we have to move at the speed of a network. As McChrystal said, it takes a network to fight a network. But the last one is the most important, the E for experimentation. How do you build in the psychological safety to try? As Mandela said, I never fail, I either win or I learn. But if companies really want to increase innovation, they will have to lower the cost of failure. You can't wait for the final Harvard Business Review article anymore. This is no longer about lessons learned, it's about lessons learning. We will have to figure it out as we go along. So if you want to reinvent yourself for the never normal, if you want to prepare for a world where technology has a mind of its own, I think the biggest reset is here. I mean, if you look at us humans, skills, minds, and hearts, skill set, I mean, the world is going to see a continuous cocktail of technological acceleration. And reskilling is going to be one of the top priorities for any organization. But more important is mindset.
How do we build in you know, an environment where people are passionately curious about the day after tomorrow, endlessly open-minded about the never normal, forcefully resilient and vigorously creative if we want to figure out how to leverage the potential of that clairvoyance? And finally, why? It's the heart set. The challenges are very real. And how do we convince people that it's not just an individual, but a collective exercise? I get truly inspired by this. I think I realize that there are still a lot of people out there who don't see the exciting potential that is there for that never normal. But I am an absolute optimist. But one thing is clear, we will have to turn this all the way up to 11. Not just organizations or companies, but individuals, leaders. Think about this. Not just you as your organization, but you as an individual. How are you dealing with that day after tomorrow? And there is no delay. It's now. The future is already here. Let me end with my favorite quote from Maya Angelou. If you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how truly amazing you can be. I wish you the very best in what I call the never normal. Welcome back. Thank you, Peter, for this amazing and insightful presentation. Of Thank you. Especially of this past 15 months, <laughs> which brings, which brought quite a lot of change, definitely. Um, the first question that comes to mind would be, do, do, do you think we just lived collectively a kind of singularity? Is that what you're trying to demonstrate? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a singularity. I would call it uh, an acceleration. I, I think um, a lot of the things that happened in, in the last 15 months were basically just immediately raising it to the next level. Um, but I think that's, that's far from a singularity. I think there is still so much things that are going to happen in the next decade that is, I think, truly interesting to watch that probably will bring us closer to some of those things which are more singularity minded. But for me, honestly, the last 15 months have basically been an acceleration, um, a hyper acceleration, and I think a permanent acceleration. And I think, um, let's be honest, in many, many different markets and sectors, it would have taken us years to actually see what we accomplish in months. And I think many clever entrepreneurs are seizing onto that. They're locking onto the potential of that new or never normal. But honestly, what we have in front of us, um, I think is going to be even more impressive. And if we want to talk about heading towards the singularity, I think we probably have to look at the future and not just at the last 15 months. Talking about the future, let's look back in the past for just a few seconds. One of our viewers is asking, what surprised you the most about the, the transformation that we've observed in these last few months? Like, what was your biggest surprise? Well, I think my biggest surprise is that um, I would been talking about digital transformation you know, for the last 10, 15 years. And often uh, I would categorize uh, what I do as, as partly corporate entertainment. I would get invited by a company and they have a big event and I would talk about what I see happening in the world of digital and they would say, oh, very, very interesting. And then sometimes they would ask me back a year later or two years later, I'm, I think, oh, that's interesting. I, I'm curious to see what they've done with it. And usually it was very little. And I think my biggest surprise is that how quickly some of the people that were even skeptical actually rose up to the opportunity to do something with that. I mean, I'm quite sure that probably, you know, um, out of the 10 people I could have talked to in January of you know, last year, you know, would it be possible to run your business completely in an online digital environment? Probably at least 70% would have said, no, that's impossible. We can't do that. Maybe other companies, but we can't do that. And it was amazing how in a matter of weeks, companies with leaders who were quite skeptical and reluctant actually made it happen. That's what I call the, the great digital stress test. And as I said, most companies pass the digital stress test. So I think that's something which truly surprised me. The second thing that surprised me is that some companies did extremely well. I mean, we all know the horror stories. I mean, you look at hotels and restaurants and bars and airlines, terrible. But some companies and some sectors did tremendously well. Some 
I would call it by accident. I mean, I had the chance to do a session with the management team of Kellogg's. Well, you know what? They had a, the best year ever in 2020. We were all at home eating cereal. Um, but a company like Duracell, for example, had a killer year. I mean, apparently we were all at home, you know, clicking on our remote controls and running out of batteries. So I would call that almost by surprise, but some of those sectors did very well. And then you saw those companies that really took advantage of a new way of working. And I believe that when I talk about agility and resilience, they really showed that. So um, a lot of positive surprises. And I can only hope, honestly, that a lot of those positive surprises are going to remain there. And it's something that we can actually leverage for the future. And, and speaking of kind of rebounding on all of that, you talked about the sweet spot before reaching the peak during your presentation. What are your best, um, what is the best argument to convince organizations to take action now? Some, some are the, at that sweet spot, definitely, from what you've said. So what would, you, what would be your best advice? Well, my, my best advice is to, um, once the pandemic starts to die down, is to really not be naive enough to think that we're going to go back to the old normal. That's, that's what I really would urge companies to do. Not to scare them, and that's not what I want to do. But I think being alert of that constant volatility and that never normal that is ahead of us, I think is essential. And the sweet spot is a very difficult thing because it's counterintuitive to think about the future when you're doing very well. And I think that is, you know, you, you could probably talk for three days about all the companies that didn't see it coming. And often the strange thing is they actually did see it coming, but they didn't do anything about it. And if you're doing something which makes money and you're doing well, you have an extreme natural tendency to keep doing what you're already doing. And I think having that mindset and that alertness to think about what could be next and how to prepare for that and how to think about the day after tomorrow, I think this is something that is going to be crucial now that the pandemic is, is starting to slow down. So I would urge companies to, to spend time on that, to be alert. And when I talk about the day after tomorrow, many people say, oh, wow, that, that was really funny. You know, and especially when I talk about the, the shit of yesterday that you have to clean up. But I really mean that 70, 20, 10, how much time you spend on today, the pressing, urging issues, tomorrow, classic way of looking at it, and then the day after tomorrow. And this is something where you think about this in your company, your organization, your teams, your, your, your employees, but also in the oversight, in, for example, your management team, in your board. I mean, I, um, as I said, in the past, I've been asked to do a lot of these sessions and I love doing them. But if you only think about the day after tomorrow, once a year in your offsite in Evian, where you have you know, a comfortable spa to think about the day after tomorrow, and then you go back to the shit of yesterday for 364 days, and only you're going to revisit the day after tomorrow next year in Evian, I don't think that's going to work anymore. So we need a permanent radar on that day after tomorrow. And even more important, we need a way to actually turn those ideas into execution. Definitely noted, especially for the next Uzi Live show. I guess <laughs> something is going to be kind of changing forever with that event as well. Edwige um, asks, uh, getting back to the subject of the Phoenix and the Unicorn, can you consider the Phoenix uh, able to provide innovation as well as unicorns? Absolutely. So this is something where um, there's been quite a debate on this. I mean, some people say, you know, the only people who can really, really radically innovate are new players. They are the unicorns. And I say no. I have seen the capability of traditional companies reinventing themselves. But, you know, I use that metaphor of, you know, the, the treadmill you know, and, and it's, of course, a lot more difficult because the bigger you are, the heavier you are, the more bureaucratic you are, the slower you are. So it takes more effort to do a phoenix than to do a unicorn. But it is possible. And I've seen a lot of examples. I mean, I, I mentioned the Walmart and the Disney's of this world, but a company like Microsoft is a great example. And people always say, yeah, but those are B2C companies. It's easy to do it when you're in the B2C business. But it equally applies to B2B as well. And actually, one of my favorite companies is a French company called Saint-Gobain. 
I mean, they make glass, glass windows. And they, it's a really funny story. I don't know if you know that, but they've been around for like 300 years. And they go back to the time of when Louis XIV wanted to build Versailles and he didn't have enough French engineers to make mirrors because mirrors were like the electronics of, you know, 300 years ago. And the Silicon Valley of mirrors was actually the island of Murano just off Venice. The, the Venetians were brilliant, you know, technicians and engineers that invented flat glass and mirrors. And it's a funny story because Saint-Gobain actually started when Louis XIV actually kidnapped some of the best technicians from Murano and got them to France to build Versailles and the Hall of Mirrors. And eventually that company now, 300 years, is Saint-Gobain, which is a really funny story. But you can say, how boring is Windows, right? I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. And then I recently had a chance to spend some time with this company where I believe they're one of the phoenixes you know, in, in being. Um, they are reinventing glass windows to become, you know, not just consuming energy, but generating energy. Glass windows become connected where they're part of a network where they can actually then distribute that energy to other resources. They actually look at the light and they can actually change the composition to let less light in to think about, you know, ambient light, but also about temperature control. And it's really funny to see a company that for 300 years has been focused on making windows as cheaply as possible is now completely rethinking itself with completely novel market product and model innovation. So if a 300 year old company in, in France can reinvent itself, I think phoenixes are very real, but it's not a given. Uh, it's something where you have to work on and it's something that doesn't come easily. You really have to put in the effort, but I absolutely believe there are plenty of phoenix opportunities out there in many, many markets. Very good transition for the next question from Eric, who is wondering what about Europe? Because we had a lot of examples from the US and from China. So do you think that um, French and European companies uh, are prepared for such a new normal? Yes and no. I mean, yes, in terms of our skills, our know-how, um, we are still on top of the world when it comes to actually having the opportunity to, uh, to reinvent ourselves. I mean, we have brilliant engineers. I mean, we have a long tradition of engineering and innovation in Europe, and that goes back to the schools, uh, the, the Ecole Polytechnique in, in France, I mean, the institutes in, in Germany. We have a long tradition of being able to innovate. But the biggest problem we have is our belief in ourselves and the guts. I always make the joke, I mean, I'm European, but I lived in the US for a long time. If you look at the US, everybody is not just capable of generating an idea, but they have the audacity to actually voice the idea. And you know, even if it's a crazy idea, there's this belief that if you're crazy enough, you might be able to actually do it. We have lost that in, in somehow in probably the last couple of hundred years. I always make the joke, the people who still live in Europe today, they come from ancestors who 300 years ago were too afraid to get on the boat. I mean, our great grandfathers were chicken and said, no, I'm not gonna get on that boat. I mean, that's, that's too risky. So as a result, the people who were left behind became more risk averse. And this is a, a very cultural thing that I believe that we have to overcome, that we have to change. And one of the frustrating things is, you know, I, I've been taking a lot of executives from Europe to places like Shenzhen or Tel Aviv or Silicon Valley for a long time. And every time we would go to, I don't know, Google or Facebook or any of those really innovative companies, and you would go to the, the people in the companies that will be doing like, you know, deep machine learning or the future of AI, often they will be Europeans. They would be French engineers or Italian or Germans or Dutch. And you would think, why could not they do it, you know, back home in Europe? And I believe that this is one of the big challenges we have. We certainly have the ingredients, but getting back that courage, that audacity, the guts, and probably the risk profile, that is something where we have to change the culture and mindset. And I don't think it's too late, but it's certainly almost midnight when you think about, you know, our chances to, to realize that. So I guess we'll have to be a bit more risk prone in the coming few years. 
Uh, Emmanuel is also wondering uh, what link do you make between this new never normal world and the in parallel to the increasing aspiration to come back to nature? How does that work together? I think it's actually something that coincides. Um, and I think it's something where, again, if we talk about Europe, we could probably make a difference. Um, I believe when I talk about the seismic shocks, I mean, the ecological part is a really, really big part of that. And I think being able to leave the planet, you know, one generation after another in a better state is something that we have to inspire. And I think there's a lot of new opportunities for innovation, technology that actually gets into that. It's not just digital anymore. It's not just, you know, tech for tech. It's about, you know, bringing in the world of biology and the world of, you know, nature, the world of medicine into that equation. And I think Europe has enormous potential to do a lot of good there, but we need to figure out how to get there. And this is something where, you know, maybe one of the biggest bottlenecks we have is our European institutions, because I think what Europe is very good in is making, you know, fines. I mean, you know, when, when we realized that we didn't have Google and Facebook in Europe, I mean, we didn't have our own version. We were invaded by the U.S. technology giants. The likes of Margrethe Vestager said, fine, we'll, you know, give them a $5 billion fine. And I think that is quite sad because I think we have to really look into ourselves and figure out why didn't we actually culture and nurture those technological giants ourselves. And we shouldn't make the same mistake when we think about you know, making the world smarter, fairer and greener. I think the European Union has a very ambitious you know, green deal, but if it's primarily punishing people who aren't doing well enough, we have to figure out how to stimulate and how to invigorate and how to get people excited about that. And I believe that this is something where I don't think Europe is doing a good enough job. So I think it's certainly compatible, but I think instead of thinking about finding, we have to think about inspiring. Great, great answer. Uh, another question from Edwish. Um, related to Phoenix uh, innovation, with uh, the acceleration and acceptation of never normal, uh, do we have time to just en enjoy the present? Absolutely. I mean, uh, when I talked about the fact that we're going to have this avalanche of change, and at the same time we have to put the human at the very center. And, you know, for a long time, I think technology didn't really help because I don't know about you guys, but the last 15 months have been more hectic than ever before. I don't travel anymore, but you can do webinars in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And if you're not careful, you're going to do Asia Pacific at six o'clock in the morning. And you're still here in your Apple Chapel by eight o'clock in the evening doing something for the US. So has technology really improved our capability to enjoy life? Well, it's, it's a dilemma because at the same time, the last 15 months, many of us have been able to reconnect better with our families, better with you know, our environments, better with being able to take a walk. And finding that balance, I think, is something that we have to take very seriously. I honestly don't want to go back to all that flying again. I, I love doing things like this because I've been able to, I think, get messages across and do meaningful work. And I don't have that stress uh, of the travel and I can really enjoy life in a better way. So I think it's capable of combining it. But it's something that we do have to probably factor in. Look at how many people got a burnout in the last 15 months. And as I mentioned in my presentation, even the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, says too much screen time can really damage your mental health. Think about what the never normal could do, you know, both in terms of opportunities to you know, actually enjoy life more, but also in terms of pressuring and burning and you know, burdening ourselves. So I think finding that balance is going to be one of the things that are going to be crucial. And I honestly believe it's something that we're going to have to learn. We're going to have to deal with. Maybe it's something that should be part of education. You know what? I still think that our education system is the slowest moving part in society. Why do we still you know, instruct kids on you know, things like geography and history when they grew up on Wikipedia and Google Maps, but maybe finding part in our education to prepare them for a never normal and to have a healthy balance, you know, both physical and mental, might be more important than memorizing you know, the war 
uh, scenes of uh, you know, great dictators in the last 2,000 years. <laughs> great, great advice, I guess. Uh, and um, on kind of the same note, you, you talked about connections and especially about hyper connections. What kind of danger do you feel there is there in terms of, for example, and that's a very European uh, topic, data privacy or hackers? How do we manage to overcome that kind of danger that hyper connectivity poses? The more connected you are, the more dangers you have, but also the more advantages. And it's, it's really finding a right balance. Absolutely, we, we live in an age where um, the use of you know, these technologies for bad purposes is more prevalent than ever before. I give the example, I don't know what the situation is in France, but where I live in Belgium, for example, the traditional crime uh, numbers have been going down. So, of course, the last 15 months, everybody was at home, so it was a bad time to be a burglar. But you know, traditional crime has actually been dropping. And you can say, wow, that's a really good thing. We have less burglaries and less you know, carjackings and, and, and you know, all those horrible things are going down. What it turns out is that in many, many Western economies, we see that organized crime said, you know what? Why don't we use the new technologies? And we now have the rise of what we call malevolent networks. I recently did quite a lot of work on that subject where you have networks of organized crime who can probably earn a lot more using you know, the network and digital to figure out how to rob people than breaking into somebody's house. How old school is that? And this is really scary because what you see is that actually organized crime is now probably um, accelerating their digital transformation. I don't know if you have that you know, uh, burning question, but if you have to launder 30 million euros, um, you can just go onto the dark web and write out a tender. And within 24 hours, you will have seven suppliers who can do money laundering as a service and you connect to their APIs and it's all done electronically. I mean, what you see is that the criminal activity of the economy is more digital than the real economy. So clearly something that is very dangerous. But at the same time, there is the opportunity where if we can actually use that, we can actually transform many markets and industries. Now that's the big picture. It also goes down to the individual. I mean, you mentioned GDPR. This is for me one of the great examples where Europe completely, completely screwed up. I mean, I remember my initial enthusiasm about GDPR, protecting privacy. I mean, who could be against that? And then you saw the horror of GDPR. I don't know how you experienced it, but first you got hundreds of emails of people saying, oh, you know, please stay with us. You know, click here to read our 27 page consent form. Now I get as much spam as before. On every website, I still have to accept the cookies and it's almost impossible to not accept the cookies. I mean, honestly, companies spent a fortune implementing GDPR and has this really helped us as consumer? No, it was a great example of how Europe was trying to regulate itself into the future and failed miserably. And this is where we have to think about the future going forward. A few weeks ago, we had Thierry Breton and Margrethe Vestager proudly announcing that they were going to have new European regulation on artificial intelligence. You know what? I thought it was a sad presentation because primarily they were talking about what wouldn't be possible. For example, facial recognition. Honestly, if you go to China, you can have serious questions about the government. I mean, there's a lot of things you can say about China. But look at facial recognition. This is completely embedded into the economy. You pay with your face. If you arrive into an airport in Shenzhen and you don't know where to go, they recognize your face and say, your terminal's over there. I really think that those are incredible opportunities to make our lives better and richer. And if we in the European are going to say, no, no, we, we should isolate ourselves, we're going to become, I think, honestly, that little, you know, Gallic village you know, that tries to isolate itself from the rest of the world. And I'm not sure if we actually have, 
you know, the, the, the magic potion to get us through. So I'm quite skeptical. I know that there are a lot of bad things that can happen, but I believe that instead of shying away from that, we have to embrace it, look at the opportunities, and of course, figure out how to catch the bad guys and weed out the things that are completely bad. But hoping that it's just going to go away if we ignore it, I think will be really, really naive. And on that note, that's all the time we have, Peter, but that was a, such a great answer. Uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. It was really, really great having you with us. I hope you have a nice end of day. Please stay at the UZ, enjoy the other conferences and presentations, and I'll leave you to it. And Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for having me.